All right, so you are joining this episode already in progress. If you have not yet listened to part one, go ahead and do that. Stop this. Pause this. I promise we'll wait. Go ahead. Do it. All right, and yo, so you said that we're going to be getting into race. Mm -hmm. And I just need to take a breath for a second because <laughs> you got my pressure up. You got you got me going. Go ahead. Let's let's dive into it. Take me take me on a journey. Where you want to go? What's the what's the conversation? Um, I guess we should start at the beginning. So a long, long time ago, everybody So there was a big bang, yada yada yada. It was a big bang. <laughs> it was a big bang. Um, Adam and Eve, you know, they, they had some, some kids and, you know, <laughs> and everybody on earth was living as, as, as humans. Right. And then one day in the Western part of Africa, or maybe it was in the South, I'm not sure exactly when it happened, but there was this group of people and they came along and they said, I'm white, you're black, and white is better. And, you know, the, the, the people who be, who came to be known as black, they are, they're warriors, they're proud people. So they said, what, what you mean white is better than black? I'm going to prove to you that black is better than white or black is just as good as white. But really what they should have said was, that's ridiculous you're not white, you're a human, I'm a human, and I'm not going to play this game where I try to prove my worth because of the melanin in my skin. Get the fuck out of my face. So um, that's really where, <laughs> that's where, that's where it starts. That's where it starts, you know, um, and I'm just going to leave it there. <laughs> Here's what. Uh-huh. Here's what I would have said. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you'd be like, okay, I'm white, you're black. This is what it's going to be. First of all, I'm like, okay, we're neither of those things, but we are different. Mm. Here's the thing. Here's, here's what I feel like. When it comes down to the the root of race, this contrived sort of it's a you know, social construct yeah. fiasco, right? <laughs> um, when it comes down to race, mm -hmm. people people you know hate the the differences. That's that's really what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, "Hey, we're different," and let's explore that, or you know. You do this and I do this, but that's cool, right? Mm -hmm. You 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 eat this and I eat that. Oh, cool! <laughs> and just leaving it, right? Right? Mm -hmm. You don't season your food and I do. Oh, cool! <laughs> 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 Why don't you try some of this? Mm -hmm. And then you know you say, "Oh, this actually is good. Mm -hmm. It's spicy," <laughs> and you'd be like, "Well, what do you mean it's spicy?" <laughs> it's just salt, nigga. <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> but you know. So so that's really the issue at the root of it all is like instead of you celebrating or exploring those differences and appreciating them, mm -hmm. you immediately be like, oh no, that's different. Yeah. That and you 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 and that's easy to do. Mm -hmm. That's that's the that's the thing. It's human nature. It's easy to be like, I don't know, I don't like that. Or I don't know what that is. It's human nature. And it's almost All right, so it's human nature. Uh -huh. It's when I say when I say human nature, yeah. it's it's human nature to to see something that you're unfamiliar with yeah. and get cautious. Right. Meaning you know, so if you in the if you in the wilderness and you happen upon mm -hmm. a fucking grizzly bear, yeah. you're gonna be like, oh shit, hold on. Okay. Let me fucking figure out how I'm gonna you know, I gotta step back. Yeah. Oh, this motherfucker gonna go off, uh -huh. and it's—I mean, it's it's just, it's just, it's a it's an animalistic trait to okay be cautious when you're around something that you don't know. I but I agree. As human beings, we have a consciousness where we right. can say this is this is different. Let me be cautious. Cautious being respectful, but right? Here's the thing, though. 
I'm gonna ask you a question. Mm -hmm. When did you like first become aware of race? How old were you? Aware of race? Aware of, of race. Like when did you first you, you know, been, realize I mean you would have you were black. You would have had been a school child. Mm-hmm. Do you remember right? when you remember when for you? So I don't I mean I don't think I remember when. I think it just all for me it was all it always was. Mm. Okay. Cause because I didn't grow up in that era where it didn't happen. You know, or where it was like a whole thing. Yeah. So it it just kind of was a always was kind of thing. Okay. Right. So there was a point that you became aware of race because it's a fact that Yeah, I'm sure. No child But I don't know what it was. Yeah. I, I remember when I became aware of race. I was in I was in second grade. It was right when I moved back to America from Ghana and it was this little white boy named Timmy. And we were, you know, not, playing outside. Not his name was Timmy. Like it was Timmy. Yeah. I wish I could remember his last name. Um or it might have been Josh Nussenfeld. I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, we were playing outside and I think he called me the N word. He said something racial. And I just had this moment where I was just like, because, you know, live, living in Ghana and even now to this day, like black isn't black wasn't my primary identity. And if you were if, if you grew up in another country if you grew up in ghana like your primary identity isn't black but like in the states your race is your primary identity so it's just like that's a concept that um it doesn't come naturally to 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 people to humans and and i asked you about when you first became conscious of it because with kids like none of them are born aware of race and if you just let kids be kids and play. They'll grow up thinking, oh, that's my brother, you know? With right. Stuff. I think, okay. Mm -hmm. I, so, Because I understand your question. I think really, yeah. for me, mm -hmm. I, I must have I must have been aware early on because mm -hmm. I was always, I was always into trouble mm -hmm. because I always like took up for myself or knew when something wrong was happening towards me. Okay. And was it like racist? For racist? Racist? Like, definitely. Wow. Yeah, because you're, you're from the South, so you definitely... So, it. like, okay. Like, let's say, let's say for an example, let's say for an example, so like, if I was a kid mm -hmm. and we're in class and somebody's like, fuck it with you, you know, kids just do stuff. Let's say somebody's like throwing something at you. Right. Right. And they throw it at you. And then the minute you get ready, you throw it back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then it's a whole fucking thing. Yeah. Then, then it's like, okay, why would you throw that? Number one. But also you get treated totally differently. It's like, but they threw that at me first. And yeah. you don't, you know, you, it's like, no, I don't want to hear that. What do you mean they threw it at you first? You, you, you know, escalate the situation or, or you get removed from the classroom or you get removed from the situation or it becomes a whole fucking fiasco because you responded you know to something else. When shit like that started happening to me, that's when I realized like, okay, it's, it's because I'm black. Wow. Or it's because you feel like I'm a threat because I'm a, I'm a black boy. Damn. Or I, you feel like I'm going to fucking cause damage because I'm a black boy. Yeah. I was in those situations a lot as a kid. So. Yeah. And and it's crazy because like seventy percent of teachers are white women, so of course you had those situations going. Especially up. especially back then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> especially back then, right? <laughs> These teachers, first of all, teachers were old. Uh huh. Less I knew, teachers were old. I I, I didn't have my a young teacher until I was like about to finish school, and I and then and then I didn't even respect him because fuck you still, sir. <laughs> I forget his name, but it's gonna come back. Fuck you still because he. He was so young that you're a senior in high school and that motherfucker, he was basically one of us. He was still in school type shit, you know? So he, we didn't respect him because he always played. The, he did the same shit we did. And then, and then all of a sudden he wanted to kind of garner respect. It's like, you can't, you don't get respect, buddy. You one of the, one yeah, of the students. <laughs> but, you know, I'm sorry. I, I, just kinda it's, it's funny you say that because um, 
Sean King actually went through the same experience, and he's from Kentucky. So that's kind of blowing my mind right now. How Who? That is Sean King. Wait, is it? I thought he was Jamaican. Oh wait, never mind. <laughs> Bruh. <laughs> 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 wow wow okay earth shine king style i'm sorry <laughs> wow okay Woo wait yeah. you have my like you know like somebody says a name and an image pops into your head so i was like wait that is I thought the nigga was your... i'm sorry that's funny <laughs> <laughs> Woo! I'm about to edit that out myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness, 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 goodness. So, okay, so what was your first, or what? Not even your first, because mm-hmm. that's that's hard to say. Yeah. There's so many, but what's one of your significant mm-hmm. moments where you think you experienced racism or something that lets you know you know you're a nigga, right? Oh uh, yeah, I mean. Really, what's what? What's a moment? Really, starting from the time that I moved back to America, so that was um, 1996. I was six years old, um, and you 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 hear all those sixes, right? <laughs> nah, um, but yeah. you bring us over here to the podcast, and <laughs> 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 nah, but it was just like it was a uh, to put it lightly, it was it was a big culture shock. Um, growing up, well, not growing up because, you know, I was born here, but, you know, I, I, my normal was just being around people who look like me and, you know, so coming back to the States and just starting a whole new school system, it was a big, big, uh, shock for me. And I think, uh, I'm still dealing with some of those effects, um, today, actually, but, um, yeah, it was just constant microaggressions. You know, I had teachers who uh, would try to embarrass me in front of the class. I had students, you know, uh, say different things. And then there's just also not knowing whether somebody was being racist or not, because you become so sensitive to it that, like, it just takes up shit. You know, like... It just takes. I know. I know immediately. Yeah. I know immediately when somebody. I mean, you're from the. I I have like a. I know a racist. I know a racist (laughs) by how they greet you. Yeah, yeah. Like you, you, you're. I know a racist without even speaking to them. Your sensibility. You got got like a a spider sense of that shit, man. I I believe it. I understand. Yeah. I got to a point. Mm -hmm. Listen, there's this, there's this thing, and you could, you could test this theory out too. There's this thing where. Where um, white people subconsciously <laughs> expect you to to um, what get out the way when they're walking? What's the word to to get out the way when they're walking? But I was gonna say bow down to them. Mm. But <laughs> but that's it's a real thing, right? Yeah. So what I do now, because I I go running in the morning and stuff, mm-hmm. and you know if there's a um, white person that's coming up. And I'm on the side of the street where I'm just kind of running. Yeah, I'm just gonna keep. I keep going. Yeah, straight. <laughs> I don't even. I, and, and I let them go all off into the grass and shit and wherever the fuck they want to go. Yeah, I'm not finna do it. But it's a real thing. Like it's a real thing where people don't even realize that they do certain things. Yeah, or they, you know, I'm not finna do that. Yeah, like um, when if you live in America. You know, you're you're gonna spend a a lot of time navigating race, whether you're you're running, um, just existing. You know, just existing literally requires you to um to navigate it. And I got to a point where um it just became really heavy. I was an African American studies minor. You know, I uh. I don't know how many, you know, clubs and organizations um, on campus that I was a part of, you know, I was like president of a campus organization for black men, <laughs> you know, so like I, I was deep in it, you know, I, I was deep in it. And um, as I got older, like my late twenties, 
I was just constantly angry, constantly angry. And, um, you know, the, my last uh, nine to five, like I was always on edge, you know, because I'm thinking on one hand, I have to like prove that I can do X, Y, and Z. But on the other hand, I'm just like, you know, fuck y'all. Like, I'm not going to take any of your shit. And it's just like, I was just constantly on edge. And, you know, I'm, I'm not. Okay. So there's this audio book I listened to called uh, The Power of Now. And it just talks about being present. And uh, the author, Eckhart Tolle, he said, like, the ego makes you want to be separate, right? It, it, It makes you want to be different. But, like, that separation, that difference, that causes um you know like a a lot of pain because like humans we're social creatures and you know like so he he was talking about that shit so um you know that thought was kind of in my mind uh, a little bit and then I started asking myself well in what ways do I try to separate myself or or seem different and somehow some way it, it came back to you know my identity i realized that like a lot of my suffering was coming from the fact that like i'm always on edge regarding race and then i started asking myself well who even came up with this black people didn't coin the term black that label didn't come from us negro didn't come from right. us nigga didn't come from us nigga so it's just like why am i letting my oppressor like if i'm supposed to be this radical revolutionary right why am i letting my oppressor label me why am i letting my oppressor define my reality and um i just realized that like i don't have to participate in other people's insanity like they made up this fucked up shit that requires you to always try to prove yourself to white men somehow some way like you can't win the race game you know it's called a race it implies competition like the way it's set up as long as we keep on trying to prove like our skin color is just as good as that skin color. It's always going to keep white people ahead because at the end of the day, you're talking skin color and they invented this game. You know, this is their shit. So I was just like, well, what if I step out of it? And that's why Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Good. But no, I would say that's why I don't even, Mm -hmm. I don't feel no qualms about saying when I say white people, of course, I don't mean all white people yeah. and shit, but I don't feel no qualms about having to overly explain <laughs> racism to somebody that's white. Yeah. When y'all made this shit up, <laughs> you know, oh, I don't, oh, I, I'm not racist and this is why. And no, nigga, y'all made this shit up. Don't sit here and have me explain to you right. why something is racist or, or why it's, it's a racist <laughs> thing or why it's based in racism because you made the shit up. This is your game. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> and, and another thing, I hate a motherfucker mm-hmm. to be like, oh, well, I don't see color. Those are the worst people. Mm-hmm. First of all, get the fuck away from me. Mm-hmm. If you don't see color, you don't see me. Because mm-hmm. nigga, this is what I look like and this is what I am. And and I keep telling people, mm-hmm. you got to be careful when people say shit to you like that because they're basically letting you know that they don't think of you. Mm-hmm. They they don't they don't they don't think of you in a significant manner. Right. Oh, I don't see color. Or, I'm, or my kids are mixed. I don't give a fuck. And that's the ironic thing, because like you were saying, I wouldn't give a shit. They like they made this game. See up. me, motherfucker. This is your game. They, I'm not going <laughs> to tell you how how and why something is racist. Right? Why well, I don't think Donald Trump is racist. Right. Oh my god, that's the worst. Yes, you do. You do think that. Yeah, and you know that. But here's the you know that they, they get to participate in this game whenever they want. They have an option to opt out. Exactly. When they're in their neighborhoods, right? When they're in their communities, where it's like they haven't seen a black person for like years or whatever. They're not interacting as white people. They're just being people. But with us, right. it's like whether we're with each other or with them, we're always interacting on the basis of race. So it's just like they literally took our humanness and they put it in this small box and they're just like, there, that's that's what that that's your reality. And I'm just like, fuck out of here. Like, I'm not I'm not doing it because it's just like. 
I hate racism to my bones. Like I hate injustice to my bones. I and I hate it so much that like I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that shit ends. And honestly, I can't find a better way to end racism than you know, and this probably the, the the shit that you know is gonna get me canceled or whatever. But hey, it is what it is. Like, I can't think of a better way to end racism than black people coming together, saying, "Look, we're gonna call ourselves something different, and we're gonna build our reality around what's on the inside, not around our skin color. Whatever white people are doing, that's fine, that's cool. But like, we're gonna build our own identity because, like, I just don't think there's anything radical about letting your oppressor." define your core identity so um Mm. that's that's what i'm on like i'm just like i really want this shit to end and i I think you know if collectively we did it what can they do how can you keep this whole racism going if like the majority like people don't believe in race it's like you know so i don't know i'm still developing these thoughts um but i'm curious what you think based on uh based on what i said i know i said a lot I think we're too far gone. <laughs> Needs to bring it back. I do. I think. I, no, I think. I think. We're, I think we're too far gone in terms of Ooh. removing ourselves from those identities. That's a good point. That's a good point. I think. I think that. I think that it's it's okay right. to to take um take the n word mm. take black take all those things in and be like okay i'm gonna remix this because fuck you yep <laughs> <laughs> i think that's fine i think that's perfectly fine um and i think that it, it helps to allow us to have like those that individual or separate mm-hmm. personas but that's the thing i think i think it's okay mm-hmm. to to have your own separate shit <laughs> Yeah, like you know what I mean. Right. It's one thing for us to work together mm-hmm. or eat together or party together. It's it's okay, but at the end of the day, I need my own shit too. Yeah, I want my things. We need <laughs> that, that psychological space, you know. Like we, you do we need. I want and and not even psychologically, not mm-hmm. metaphysically. I want my own tangible. Physical things <laughs> in my fucking hand. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just because, because, because I think that's the, I think that is a soft cop out a little bit. Okay. Talk to me. I think when people say, mm-hmm. it's like saying, like I said, like, it's like when you say, well, not everybody. It's like, I'm not finna do that. I'm not finna call on you. Mm. I want my own shit in my own hand mm. today. <laughs> like, the fuck? Yeah. You gotta give the motherfuckers ultimatums because because how we got here mm. wasn't pretty. We didn't get coddled into this situation. Mm. We didn't get pacified into this situation. Or didn't? Nope. So, how we get out is not pretty either. I'm not going to make you feel good that I don't want to be around you. But that's the thing. I don't. Okay, but listen. I don't. Hear me out, right? I don't, period. What, <laughs> what if getting out is as easy as dropping something? Like, you're holding a, a burning hot coal in your hand, right? And if something's burning you, what do you do? You let it go. You drop it. What What's the thing that's burning us the most? Once you find that thing, you just have to drop it and just decide, I'm not going to deal with that anymore. Because it's just like, w- what if the key to all this isn't fighting our way out? What if it's just like being at peace and just choosing not to participate in, in that toxic ideology. You know, we, we think that it has to be a struggle because black people are fighters, but the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So we got to attack this problem from like a psychological, spiritual aspect. And to do that, it has to do with acceptance. It has to do with relaxation. It has to do with, letting go of your of, of, of your, your ego based needs. And that might not necessarily be a struggle. That's all I'm saying. 
So, right, right, right. And and it's like okay, there's an abundance. Mm-hmm. There's an abundance of whatever it is you need out there. There's there's plenty of it to go around. Yeah, you know. And in fact, there's a lot of a lot of um, a lot of homelessness, a lot of famine, a lot of shit that shouldn't even be because there's plenty to go around. Yeah, for real, mm-hmm. right? And I do agree. I do agree with you to some extent. Where it's like, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna keep arguing with your face. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> Nobody got time. Nobody got time. It's- I'm not finna. I'm not finna keep going back and forth with you. Mm-hmm. I said, but 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 then also there's that there's that part of you that's like, now I say what the fuck I said, mm-hmm. or you're gonna hear what I have to say about this before I make my exit. Mm. And and I think that's really what is what it's coming down to. It's like, no. Acknowledge that you yeah. admit that you're wrong. Uh-huh. <laughs> and you know, was, that you fucked up. Honestly. I ain't gonna say that. That's, <laughs> even I won't say that. No, 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 no. You gotta say it, cause I said mm-hmm. some shit that might get me canceled. So you gotta say some shit that might get me. They can't cancel me because I this is my own shit. <laughs> the most they can do is turn the shit off. <laughs> they can't cancel me. <laughs> shit. But no <laughs> there's very little pride. Mm-hmm. All right, very little things to be proud of mm-hmm. if you're a, a white American. Wow. Okay. Unless, uh-huh. unless you ignore mm. your history. Wow. There's and very, that's just how I feel about the situation. There's very, that's deep, bro. Hey, everybody. So throughout the conversation that we were having, it seems the, the powers that be were hating on us. <laughs> and Inyo and I ended up having a few technical difficulties. Just some shit that I messed up, really. <laughs> but anyhow, I wanted to come in here and um, apologize for that. But I also wanted to give a segue into the rest of the episode in which we just take some time to switch gears all the way. And Inyo and I talk about his photography uh, career and where he's headed and the goals that he set up. So just enjoy the rest of this episode and take the time to get to know Inyo as a photographer a little bit more. Thank you. Yeah, so my first camera was a Nikon D5600. And once I got that, I uh, actually signed up for an online class and just started practicing uh, photography with uh, my girlfriend at the time. Like, I, you know, take pictures of her when we went out. And I always got a good reception, but, um, you know, it was just sort of like a thing that I did that I enjoyed. It was something new um, for me to learn. So I was just approaching it that way. So then COVID hits and, you know, everything's, everything's shut down. We got to, uh, I think it was June. Yeah, so it was June. The the first time that I went out in like months was uh, actually Juneteenth, right? Blackest day of the year. And uh, my friend Sonovia, she just invited me to take some photos of her at this picnic um, in Philly. I shouldn't say picnic. That's not actually an accurate term. But (laughs) I went. um, I took photos of everybody there. Um, you know, met some cool, cool ass people, um, like lifelong friends actually. And then I posted the pictures and the reaction that I got, it was, it was surprising. Cause you know, that was like the first time that I had really done a public event and I just got a really good reception for the photo. So that was like the moment that I started thinking, you know what, maybe I actually could do this. And over time, you know, the photography just kept on improving. I started booking jobs and um, I had a conversation with my family. We used to do a, a prayer every Tuesday um, at like eight o'clock. And 
I just told them, like, you know, I, I really think that this whole photography thing, this is me. So uh, I want you guys to help fund it. If you could, you know, buy me a full frame camera, um, I'll, you know, pay you guys back. But I, I really think this address I need to go, go in. And, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for my family because, you know, they really heard me and they were just like, all right, we're going to support you. Everybody put in some money and they got me my first full frame camera. That's what I use now. It's a Nikon um, D780. And um, it's not the rest is history because I feel like everything's still being written. But, you know, once you have that full frame, you just you can do professional jobs. And it's just a matter of making sure your skills are up to the task. So it's just been a, a an amazing journey because as I've grown in my identity as a creative, I feel like it's brought so many good things um, to my life. Uh, you know, I, the, the people I get to meet, the experiences that I, I get to be part of, um, it's just a very different track than what I was on. I was on the like corporate track, you know? Ugh. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. With, let me ask you, with with some of your... Mm-hmm. With some of your work you've done thus far, yeah. What what are some of the what are some of the things that kind of stand out to you the most as far as what you've done, or what's one of the like images that you really are proud of? So, I think one of my standout projects it's called You and I. Um, this woman randomly reached out to me on IG and just said she wanted to do a creative shoot with her boyfriend. And um, the entire thing just morphed into this really cool exploration of um, how like couples interact with each other. So it's on, um, it's on my website. Like it's, it's hard to describe, but just the images that came out of that, the the models, um, Remy and Stanley, they just gave everything uh, with their facial expressions, with their their um, their posture, and also the location was dope. It was just this wide open field. So that's definitely a standout project. It's called You and I. Um, you know, you can see it on the website. It's also on my IG. And another one uh, is this. I guess. She'd be considered like a life coach. Uh, her name is Epiphany. And um, we took, we did the shoot at an abandoned gas station. So it literally looked like a crack house or, you know, a, a meth lab. <laughs> but, you know, the photos that came out of there, um, definitely like some of my favorites. And then, of course, the stuff that I've been, uh, that I took from Ghana, it's just, it's just, it's it's my best work. Um so I have an album that's uh, on my website now. It's uh, The photos were taken at Kokrobite Beach. So um, if you ever wonder what a beach party was like uh, in Ghana, check out that album and it'll definitely give you like a feel for it. So yeah, those are, those are some of my favorite projects. What, is, what do you like to... Um, what, do you, what are you sort of most into shooting? In terms of like yeah. Yeah. subjects, you know, do you need do you need a person or are you more environmental? Like, what's what draws you in? I think I'm definitely a, a portrait photographer. Um, I like faces. I like making people look good. I like the editing pro- um, process. On my IG, like, I barely have any photos of um, nature or, or landscapes and stuff like that, but. My photography, it's starting to mix with my marketing um, background. So I find myself doing a lot more brand photography now. Um, I'll go to an event and, you know, like take photos of somebody trying to promote something or I'll do branded shoots where somebody explains their business and then I create a concept to kind of capture what their business is about um, with the video. And then um, there's also this journalistic aspect that's you know coming out more now because I was always a writer. Like growing up, that was just something I was always very strong in. And, you know, if you take enough photos and 
talk to people during shoots. It's kind of like you're interviewing them. So um, that's starting to come more in the mix with this free folk project that I'm, I'm dropping. So I'd say that's kind of where I'm at now. It's like part journalism, part uh, part photography, part like brand, you know, brand management. So yeah. If you could, mm -hmm. if you're able to, I want you to, I want you to just not even necessarily explain what it is. Yeah. But as detailed as you can be, I want you to paint a picture, if you will, or describe a photo that you're proud of, only using using your words, because you know this is an audio medium. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll leave links to your work and stuff like that, of course. But yeah. I want you to kind of, because I, I I think it's going to be really interesting to see how you describe something that you're really proud of. Yeah. So if you could describe to me mm -hmm. just something that you are really, uh, uh, you know, just something that you're really proud of and, and just kind of describe that photograph. Okay. So I'm looking at my page now, trying to see what stands out to me. So I would say it's the photos from Juneteenth because that was really where it started for me. Um, okay, so the photo that actually stands out, uh, one of my best friends, um, Ngozi. So again, like I said, I feel like that event was just, you know, some like manifestation level type thing. Um, but that's definitely one that stands out just because I don't know, like when you're, when you're open to new experiences and, um, you know, just trying to like get yourself out there, you never know what's going to happen. And, uh, Hmm. Tell actually, us no. what, what does it look like? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm about to actually describe. Yo, this is a tough question, bro. No, it's not. <laughs> Cause it's nothing. It's nothing technical. It's just you describing you. You okay. telling us the colors. You telling us the feel. I got it. You I know. got it. All right. It's not like some technical shit. All right. So yeah. I'm gonna talk about my editing process. I feel like that really. Um, I guess let you know like where my mind's at as far as how I'm editing these photos. So, all right. There's this this dude named Seth, right? the photo is black and white. I made sure there was a lot of contrast with the photo because, um, you know, he's like a strong looking dude. And if it's like, you don't have those hard lines and stuff like that, it just makes the photo look weak. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer this one, bro. Like, yeah. You were doing so, it. Okay. <laughs> right, don't so you doubt yourself like that. It's, 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 it's a big question. It is. It is pretty yeah. much what what I'm what I'm doing with that mm -hmm. is I'm just kind of getting an idea for how how you, you kind of see things. It's really it's yeah. really how I see things. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's really it's really hard to explain mm -hmm. kind of what you see through your lens without kind of showing people. Yeah. But I always like to try and ask people that I always try to um people who are in the same thing that we do because it's like well what is it that I'm seeing or what is it that that I like about this photo you know it's and really yeah, go. no go ahead no, I was gonna say it's interesting you say that because what I've learned um recently is that there's two parts to um I guess creating a photo there's what you see in the moment and that just comes from experience like you do a shoot, you look back at the photos and you're like, damn, I could have done this. I could have done that. But mm. the more that happens, the more you have these reminders in your head of like what to look for. So when you're in the moment and you finally take that picture that comes out exactly the way you saw it in your head, you know, that's a very special moment. But then there's also the editing process, which I think that's something that separates me from a lot of uh, photographers is that like, 
I actually knew how to use Photoshop before I started taking pictures. So um, off the bat, that, was, that helps. <laughs> you know, it absolutely does. Um, I was very strong with editing, you know, like first starting out. So I think that's why people responded so well um, to my pictures. But there, there's all these tiny details that you don't see at first glance, you know, and choosing where to put your subject, where to crop, knowing all the rules, like have the the person's eyes above the first third of the photo, um, knowing how to color grade, like, all right, if I add teal to the shadows, the photo's going to look more fun. But if I add blue, it's going to look more sad or this photo feels kind of classic. So I'm going to add some grain to like really bring that out. Like it's, it's just the whole creative um, exercise that, that I, I really enjoy. And um, I don't know how other people edit, but like, I always try to look at the photo and take out that special, like character. There's like a little story inside the photo. And I just try to, bring that out with the way that I edit it. So that's good. I like that. I was, I was actually kind of escaping a bit. <laughs> so <laughs> what what um what's your dream camera? What's what what's the the goal? Because yeah. a lot of times, you know, they say, you know, you know, your equipment doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's more your skill matters more than the equipment, but we all know if you get you some off like a nice ass shit, you, you, you know it's gonna fucking matter. <laughs> um, I'll tell but you what. I, what's your what's your goal? Like, do you have a camera that you're going for? Um, I definitely enjoyed you know starting out with Nikon, but I think I'm ready to switch to something else. So there's that. Um, eventually I want to be able to afford a, a red cam. That's like a forty thousand dollar camera. Yo. I'm like I'm this close to starting a GoFundMe for a rig. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm so, very much I'm very much into the, like these uh, mirrorless cameras, and yeah. I, you know, mm -hmm. that's my jump off. That's my that's my speed. But how did, how did you get started with photography? That's what I want. How, nobody ever asked me. No, I was kidding. <laughs> how did I get started? So. For me, I've all, honestly, I've always been a storyteller in terms of being able to actually take a blank page and create mm -hmm. something, right? Okay. So writing was always my first thing. And I was like always trying to think of new ways to tell a story because when I write, in my mind, I can see everything that I'm writing out, you know? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't, don't think in that way. I didn't even know that. I didn't know that a lot of people weren't visual thinkers. You know, I, it's 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 just something that people have and others don't process that way. But sure. I myself, I'm a visual thinker. So like when you're telling me a story or you're saying certain stuff to me, it's yeah. always an image or something coming into my head. It's always mm -hmm. an idea. I can or see if why I asked that question before now. Yeah, yeah. So it's like when when even like right now as I'm talking to you, mm -hmm. I've already in my mind thought of what the room you're in looks like. Okay. <laughs> right? I may get it totally wrong, but in my mind, I yeah. can associate the conversation with what I think the space is. It's so weird, but I, but I always do it. So I've always like written stories. I've always kind of like done that. It's always been easy for me to do. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to look for other ways to do that. And I in the early 2000s, you know, that's when everybody was kind of moving away from VHS. They're starting to get the DVD players, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when DVDs were like, starting at the, you know, the turn of the millennium there, that was the big, the big drawing point for DVDs was the special features. Remember those? Of course. And that, so you, so, you know, you could buy two versions of the DVD. You could buy one that was just the movie. You're just going to watch it, whatever. But there's what, that one that costs a little bit extra because it has all those special features. And that's where you go in and you get to watch the behind the scenes, how this was made, how this came about. And I used to literally, pop in DVDs and just go straight to the special features and just kind of see what these people were talking about, you know? Okay. And so for me, I was always like, okay. So then I got me to a point where I was watching movies and shows and I was like, Ooh, I know how they did that. 
or oh i know how they shot that or i could see where this decision was was made or or i watch it now and i'm like i'll, I'll like a certain show because of how it's shot and people be like this show sucks or the writing on it sucks i'm like yeah but it looks good <laughs> <laughs> You know, so there's stuff like that. So I, I kind of got into visual storytelling in that way. or It became a, um, a spark for me at that moment. But I didn't really, I didn't really start taking it serious until an opportunity came up. And I was kind of um, putting together videos and editing things. Mm -hmm. And someone called me up and they were like, yo, I have something for you. And it's big something. Do you think you want to do it? And I was like, yeah. So I fucking went and did that thing. Yeah. And um, that turned into me being able to kind of have a better understanding of what I was doing. Um, as far as like, you know, how I want to shoot stuff, how I want to capture stuff, capturing stuff in the moment, but right. not only um, in just photography, because that's one, one realm um, in cinematography and, and video and, you know, just catch, capturing stuff like that. What camera so, were you using? Starting out, or at yeah. that moment, right at now. that moment I was, at that moment I know what I have. Oh my gosh, it wasn't a. I think I had a Sony a Sony mirrorless at that time. Okay, but I think it was just like like an A seven thousand or something like that. Gotcha. So nothing, nothing crazy, mm -hmm. but it was a, it was enough to kind of get the job done. Now I use a Black Magic. Okay, uh, I never yeah. heard about talking about that. Black Magic. So it's a, mm -hmm. it's a cinema. Uh, it's a little pocket cinema pocket. Camera. It's it's my it's my my step stepping stone into a rare camera. <laughs> 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 you got to look it up though. The Black Magic. It's a uh, pocket pocket cinema, six K, right? Mm -hmm. you, if you if you plan on shooting a lot more video, go Which for I, it. I do. So pocket six K. Hold on, I'm gonna. I, I, I'll I'll send it to you. Okay. It's black. It's black magic. Black magic is one word, and it's they call it a pocket cinema camera. Yeah. There's a 4K one that's been out, but there's a 6K one that's um kind of around. You could probably find like a used one nowadays, but they're pretty expensive. But anyhow, the um that that's kind of what I work with now in terms of shooting video. It just really gets really good footage in that way. So I haven't shot as much photography as i've wanted to as of late the last thing i did was working with um working with a musician i've always i'm always working with people in music which kind of presents a whole different aspect for um for what yeah. you're getting with photography so there's the the live music experience mm -hmm. what'd you say do you sing no <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I probably could, but I, I don't. But no, I've always been around musicians. So, I, so for me, the biggest thing that I've done was capturing musicians in their element. Um, okay. kind of capturing things in the moment was was really hard because it's one thing, you know, when you're a portrait photographer, it's very um, a lot of stuff is very intentional. You may not, you may like point and shoot, and you might get, you know not get what you want, but in the midst of those changes or those different poses that you're going to go for, yeah. something will come out of it. It's like, this is the one I was, I, I yeah. like, right? Absolutely, yeah. So, so that's a different thing as opposed to when your subject is constantly in motion or when you are um, capturing something and you got to get that right angle, but there's a sea of people in the midst of it. So you got to navigate around and really, you know, figure out where am I going to get this shot from? when am I going to get it or you know you have you almost have to get people to to hear the music through your images so that <laughs> that was a lot for me but it was mm -hmm. a huge learning curve because I kind of got pushed into it and had to figure it out along the way and I, and as I kind of did it more and more I was like oh this is it or this is the one or this is my angle or this is yeah. you know that magic moment yeah so I, I kind of approach it in, the, in a storytelling aspect, I want people to, you know, they already those saying is a picture's worth a thousand words, yeah. But I also want to be able to. I don't want you to just kind of be guessing what the words are. I want to kind of lead you and say, yeah. okay, this is the story I'm telling. 
there's a thousand words here, but this is the sequence. <laughs> like <laughs> I want I want it to be very um very hmm. very 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 intentional in terms of what the end product is. So when yeah. I'm color correcting, I, yeah. I tend to and I I know it's a lot of I know a lot of photographers don't do this, but yeah. I tend to um oversaturate. Okay. Right? Yeah. Um a lot of people don't it really just depends on what you want to go for. But I tend to oversaturate because I, I like the vibrancy of that or like how that feels. Yeah. Um I I've done like black and white shoots and stuff. Mm-hmm. And they they're good, but it's not it's not something that yeah does anything for me exactly. because I always kind of want to bring out something or I just want to kind of manipulate something. Uh, color correcting, I can do that for hours on end for sure. Oh yeah, yeah, it's definitely you know. Like, like you know what um I struggle with is actually working fast because I could spend hours on one photo. And I know, like, the professionals that I talk to, they always talk about just making things as efficient as possible. So Hell yeah. I'm going to tell you now, I'm going to tell you now, the the biggest, the biggest thing for me, like I said, I was working with musicians, so I'm working in the entertainment aspect of things. Even though there's an art to it, you, you will get booked more likely if you have a quicker turnaround time versus something that's completely stellar it sucks but you kind of learn how to find your balance you or you know you learn when to say okay that's enough mm. <laughs> that straight hair is not gonna fucking change anything <laughs> but I, i've kind of i've kind of gotten i think i've gotten a rhythm in that aspect where i've learned to be like okay i'm not doing any more tweaks i'm done yeah yeah that's enough that's enough what are some of the um what are some of the goals or some of the uh kind of shoots you want to do as you kind of go forward into this world of photography? Because officially it sounds like for you it's only been well, yeah. about a year now. Yeah. Um, officially, anyway. I know you were doing it for work right. and stuff, but which, you didn't realize which, you were doing it. Which is insane. Which is insane. Cause yeah, this is um Juneteenth, you know, twenty one and uh that's insane because it feels like a really long time and it's it's interesting because the people from last year like just seeing where where they're at now and it's also really it feels good that some people they actually remember me and, and they remember the photos so I went to a uh what would you call it? I don't know. It's kind of just like a, a a kickback. So, um, this uh this girl named Sumi, right? She has this magazine called uh, Rawcast, and she asked me to do some event photography for her. So, and she knows she was at that Philly event that I went to on Juneteenth last year. So, as I was talking to some of the people there, I recognized some of them, and they recognized me. And one of them even said. Oh wow! Um, you always take good pictures. Take mine, and that was such a huge compliment to me because I never thought that this would get to a point where people actually like remember my work. You know, that's I feel like a, a very special moment in every photographer's life when it's like, oh wait, people actually like know my work. So, um, but back to what you were saying, I it really just hit me right now that it it has only been a year <laughs> so yeah that's kind of wild yeah that's quite a bit of progress and, and so it's still fresh for you because you still have a, a lot of you have a lot of, of ways it can go you know I still, I still i still got plenty to learn but the thing i'll say is that once you are operating within where your gift is it's kind of like a fish being dropped in the water and just like knowing how to swim. I I know there's still like a lot of technical things that I have to to learn, but yeah, I feel like the core is is there because this is like 
who I am, you know, like I, I'm a creative. So when I have to learn something or do something new, I'm able to navigate it just in in a way that flows rather than having to like fight, you know, to to make something happen. So um yeah, that's that's something. Listen, I, I, I definitely wish you the best because I mean it's like I said, it's just it's such a young journey so far, but mm-hmm. you've already kind of, you know, captured some really good shit already. So it, definitely don't stop. And then you get to you get to um, the more you go to uh, Ghana and the more you shoot stuff, mm-hmm. you know, abroad, then you get to tell people you're international photographer. <laughs> Yeah, I can say that right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you kind of put a different twist on it. <laughs> the more people I work with, I, I have a quota. So the more people I work with, eventually I'm going to be like, oh, so I'm a celebrity photographer. I'm going to say is. that. There you know? <laughs> yeah, you just got to, you know, put a little spin on it. Right, right. Overall, I want to say I, I definitely enjoyed talking to you. I, I honestly, I could keep going. Same but I, nigga, I got to eat. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I'm starving. Oh shit! Oh shit! But we definitely, we definitely got to figure something out because everybody knows I got to get out of here. I got to get to Ghana, and I gotta, I gotta figure out because we I ain't trying to go. I ain't trying to go to you know to fake Ghana. I ain't trying to just be like, oh, yeah, I'm a tourist, and this is the. I'm trying to see some shit. I'm trying to hear some shit, or or be in a conversation. I don't know what the fuck somebody's saying. Listen, you're gonna get <laughs> that and more. You know, you just gotta, <laughs> gotta take that leap, and it's gonna be people there to help you. Um, Ghana is oh, a very man. friendly country. Everybody literally wants to help you. So, whatever you're looking for, it's gonna manifest out there. Because here's the crazy thing: this is the last thing I'm gonna say. I had all these ideas that I thought would happen. 10 years down the road, like the whole idea for free folk. I thought that's something I'd be doing in like five years. As Mm -hmm. soon as I got to Ghana, like all the pieces started falling into place as far as like people to meet, you know, um, people to like take me around and, and just even running into random people on my very last day in Ghana. Right. I went to get some food. I was with my cousin, shout out to Selassie. And I ran into this um, American girl. Her name is uh, Janera. And, you know, we got to talking and she invited us to have lunch with her. And all these people showed up. Like, literally the people that I needed to meet in order to, I guess, take the next next step. They all literally just showed up to lunch. And I was able to network with them and, you know, get the information that I needed and, and make the in last... One, in one place. In one place. On my last day. So... You know, I don't know what to call it, what to label it, but um, I just feel like people need to go and and, and experience that energy, you know? Um, And last, last thing, that's what Free Folk is about. It's it's an immersive experience. This this nigga nigga ain't got got no last thing. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to say one more thing. And and on top of that, and and one lastly, (laughs) and uh, second of all... (laughs) This, this and, my, by the way, uh, <laughs> you, you like a you like an infomercial, but wait, there's more. <laughs> yeah, but oh, shit. so with free folk, when before I left for Ghana, people were asking me to like you know tell them what it's like, and I just felt like I could show them better than I could tell them. And as I started filming the interviews, I just felt like having straight up interviews wasn't enough. So I decided to make it a an immersive experience. So that means that Free Folk was going to have interviews, but it's also going to have the photos. It's going to have the video. My cousin's a DJ. He created an incredible soundtrack. And it's the type of experience where I just want you to walk away with a certain feeling. Like you're going to get a lot of information. But the feeling that you'll have at the end of watching each episode, that's that's the main thing. So, um, yeah, yeah, uh, I just wanted to, you know, put that in everybody's ear real quick. You know, check out Free Folk. Um, episode one is dropping soon. And um, I filmed four episodes, so I'm going to try to drop them all uh, 
before like July and then I'm going to keep you know, reaching out to more people, you included, uh, Tiran, so that uh, I could film additional episodes. I mean, you know, I'm down. Yes, sir. I'm down sitting running my mouth for <laughs> an hour or two. <laughs> <laughs> and, yo, go ahead and let the people know where they can find you, where okay. they can look you up, and where to expect um, free folk. Yeah, so thank you for having me. I had a really great conversation. It's actually like my first podcast interview. So I really um, appreciate you having me on. Like, I, I do really take people's it. podcast virginity on this program. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, that's that's a great niche to be in, honestly. We really got to talk some business shit after this. But, all right. So, um, you know, really grateful to to be on here. Um, you can just find me on IG. Type in Enyo, E-N-Y-O. And you should see uh, a page that pops up that says NEO Creative Director. I have like a bright green profile picture, so you can't miss it. And um, from my IG, you can get to my website where you can view, um, you know, my gallery. You can, you know, schedule a shoot, uh, whatever you want to do. So, yeah, that's it. All right. And y'all wore me out, (laughs) y'all. And you brought the heat today. Listen, you know where you can find us. You can go ahead and look us up on the internet, all over the social needs. That's ubiquitous blacks everywhere you can find it. If you can't spell it right, Google will correct you. Okay? Just sound it out. You bit you can you get it. You get it. Sound it out. <laughs> and as always, I've been T Ron. You can find me all over the social needs at, at T Ron World. You can also email us, email us um, questions, just comments, letting you know that you're enjoying what we're doing. If you have any ideas, any questions, anything you want to do, uh, if you want to be a guest on the podcast, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the list goes on. If you are following us on Apple, leave a review, and y'all know I don't like that, that shit that's not five stars. <laughs> Click five stars, leave a comment, and then I will read it on the show. I don't have any queued up, but we're going to be having a special episode that's going to be uh, being worked on here lately. I'm just trying to compile everything and it's going to be all listener email, you know, comments and shit. So get your shit read on this program. And honestly, I may have you on. I may kind of give out a prize or something. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. Okay. So you probably have to catch me in Ghana and see what the fuck. <laughs> we're gonna be going. Yo, you're coming. But. Um- I'm gonna. I, I'm trying. I'm. I'm trying to work it out. I promise you. <laughs> I'm telling you. Listen, we're gonna go, but before we do, I need you to know that whether you are black in Port Harcourt, Nigeria, whether <laughs> whether you're black in Ghana. Remember this. We are black or were together, right? Everywhere. As, everywhere as fuck. <laughs> That's good, man. That's good. That works for me. 